Good evening. May I start with an enormous thank you for this award. The alumni of Clare include many extraordinary people making an exceptional contribution to society. To have been singled out is a great honour which feels very undeserved. I wonder which of you will receive this award in the years to come. Look around you for a moment and ask yourself, who is on your list? Are you? <laughs> if this award had been going in 1983 when I was sitting where you're sitting, I certainly wouldn't have put my name on my list. I spent my early days here trying to live up to the Clare reputation as described in the Varsity Handbook at the time, which declared that members of Clare were known for being rather insular, focusing on breakfast work, lunch work, supper and work, punctuated by sex with their next door neighbour, and, <laughs> and occasional appearances on University Challenge. <laughs> But to indeed I have to confess that I can't recall ever appearing on University Challenge. <laughs> I'm sure I wasn't really a very promising student at all, though luckily I was fortunate to experience some outstanding teaching here, and to this day I continue to enjoy the friendship of many people I met here at Clare. If you and I had been here in the 1930s, I don't think any of us would have chosen as prospective alumnus of the year our fellow undergraduate and modern linguist Thomas Merton, who apparently was very high living indeed, got into all kinds of trouble with the law, so much so that he was taken out of college by his guardian. He didn't even last the course. But he then later converted to Catholicism, became a Trappist monk, and one of the most prominent Catholic writers of the 20th century. Uh, his autobiography sold over a million copies. If you have an excessively wild first year, don't write yourself off just yet. <laughs> My biggest claim to fame when I arrived in 1981 was probably that I could make a fabulous Knickerbocker glory in under a minute. I'd grown up in a cafe and ice cream parlour opposite Woolworths on the Isle of Wight in the 1960s and hardly left the island before I was 16. It was a typical Italian family business in which we were all expected to work as soon as we were tall enough to see over the counter or to clear the tables. I ran it on my own for the first time in a bleak November in 1974, when my parents were at the National Ice Cream Competition in Harrogate. I was 12, I was juggling running the business with going to school, and frankly I wasn't very good at it. But I didn't mind because I was already halfway to becoming what I decided I really wanted to be, which was a criminal lawyer. I had it all mapped out. I would study at the best university I could get into and be a lawyer by the time I was 24. My role model was Harriet Peterson, a TV character who was the star of the Friday night series called Justice. She was one of a rare breed in those days, a highly successful female barrister, terribly glamorous, seemed to win all her cases. I liked the idea of that. Sadly, my plan to become a great criminal defence lawyer didn't survive my first case after qualification. I was representing a woman accused of murdering her 11-month-old baby. So she was facing the prospect of convicted of a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment. She was convicted in the end of manslaughter rather than murder and walked out of the old Bailey not to spend time in prison but to spend three years on probation. I received many congratulations on a great outcome. But I felt really knocked by it. A baby had died. How would this mother, or indeed any of the baby's family, ever recover from what had happened? How could it be a great outcome? I was simply not equipped at 25 to handle such emotionally charged work and I knew I had to change course. I jumped the fence into prosecution where the necessary legal skills were the same, but the distance from those involved made it more of an intellectual exercise than an emotional one. 
Thomas Merton once reflected on his behaviour in his younger days as a kind of denial of who he was, saying, I had done all that I could to make my heart untouchable. Perhaps moving away from defence to prosecution was my bid to make my heart untouchable too. Focusing on fraud, culminating in five years as the Chief Executive of the FSCS, the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, the organisation that protects you if your bank goes bust while still owing you money. I thought that would be a low-key job. It wasn't to be. The banking system started to fall over in 2007 and finally crashed the following year. Have you ever found yourself short of cash on a Saturday night? I certainly have. £14 billion pounds short, in fact. <laughs> On the evening of Saturday, the 27th of September 2008, I found myself negotiating a loan of £14 billion pounds on behalf of the FSCS, money which the Bank of England kindly lent us. On the Monday morning, we arranged for it to be given to Santander so that they would look after the millions of account holders of Bradford and Bingley, whose bank had, unbeknownst to them, gone bust over the weekend. It wasn't only the banks that were fragile. I myself nearly crashed in 2008 as well, because it was then that I experienced the worst day of my life so far, when my brother Anthony died unexpectedly, aged 54. When he was younger, he'd made great ice cream for our family business, and when he was older, he made great films, like The English Patient, one of the most Oscar-winning films of all time. He had everything the world values, fame, fortune, the highest professional recognition, but we missed him for everything else. His extraordinary gift for seeing the goodness in a person, his mischievous humour, his gentleness. Whilst his death was seriously painful, it also taught me many lessons that I hadn't learned to Claire that there is no substitute for a person. A person is uniquely beautiful, has unique potential, is irreplaceable. And that life can be very short, so we have to grasp the opportunities we can while we can to make the contributions that only we can make. And his death made me determined to give up my city life and find a role I could pour my whole self into mind, body, heart, and soul. I'd rediscovered my Christian faith a few years earlier, and that provided the spiritual armour to take up the emotional risk that I had as a young lawyer run away from. And so it was the following year, once the intensity of the banking crisis was subsiding, that I plucked up the courage to think about a really big change. After a few months of hard questions about what kind of thing it could be, I decided to stick my neck out and apply for my dream job, running Christian Aid, a charity working with partners across nearly 40 countries to tackle the symptoms and causes of poverty. It seemed outrageous in one way to put myself forward for a role so far out of my technical comfort zone, but I thought of all the things that seemed to be wrong in the world and thought that this could be my way of trying to make a bit of a difference to them. Landing the job after 20 years in the city, I realised I had so much to learn. In April 2010, as the new Chief Executive of Christian Aid, I found myself sitting in a slum hut near Nairobi with a young woman in the most dire poverty who'd run out of cash, desperate for cash. She needed it for her two nephews, too weak with hunger to walk to school, and for the burial of her father, lying next to her, clearly very close to the end. Not enough cash to live, not enough cash to die. She told me she was contemplating trading her virginity to pay for it all. I learned what poverty can look like close up. I saw clearly some of the key drivers of poverty too. Visiting Sierra Leone for the first time, 
I learned that there were whole communities there eating on the 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001 basis, which means once every other day. Large areas where half the population have no access to clean water at all are forced to draw their water from dirty rivers. We travelled over the worst roads I've ever experienced, and I've experienced a few. I stayed in a remote rural village in their ambitiously named new B&B called the Promised Land. Despite the name, there were no sheets on the bed, no fuel for the electricity generator and no food. I was grateful for an ensuite bucket. On the last morning of my visit, we crossed a small river on a boat and waited for the driver to take us back to the capital, Freetown. A woman emerged from a nearby building three or four times over half an hour, apparently trying to reach someone on her phone. We discovered that she was the local birth attendant, trying to raise an ambulance for a woman whose labour was going wrong. But the number is constantly engaged, she explained. And even if they answered now, given how bad the roads are, they wouldn't get here for hours. So it's probably too late. What will happen, we ask, to the mother, to the baby? She shrugs her shoulders with a weary resignation. This is not a new experience. On the way back from this remote rural area to Freetown, we pass the titanium mine. I know we're getting close, because within a few miles of it, we find the landscape is coated in red dust. The rivers and the area around them all silted up, deserted because it can no longer sustain the community. Sierra Leone, rich in highly valuable natural resources like diamonds and titanium ore, but with one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. People are making money there, but it is not translating into funds for the basic healthcare systems and other essential services everyone needs. But economic injustice isn't the only driver of poverty. In places like Bangladesh and the Philippines, I saw the price the poorest people are paying for climate change. In places like Gaza and South Sudan, I saw the price that's paid by innocent civilians living in areas of conflict and war. And wherever I have encountered people in poverty, one thing struck me more than anything else that women and girls are always worse off, personally, socially, politically, and economically. That's why at Christian Aid, we used to say that poverty has a woman's face. So often I saw that it was the women who had the courage and the energy to pursue the solutions, women who were ready to share what they had, who were most resilient in the face of so much hardship, women who would walk a path of hope that others could follow. But of course, it's not just in the global south that women are disadvantaged. Claire was one of the first Cambridge colleges to go mixed in 1972. When I came here, there were still many colleges which were men only, or only just starting to go mixed. Or to put it another way, and just try to imagine this, the colleges of this university were almost all closed to women until I was in senior school. And given the prominent role that the university plays in fielding its alumni into roles of influence, it's no surprise that the institutions of our nation are still dominated by men. I remember a JCR meeting downstairs in the crypt presenting the case for a £60 budget for the college women's group whilst a few members of the Men's Boat Club brayed and heckled and suggested I burnt my bra. I did get the money because things had started to change by then, but hey, it's a slow process. Even in Clare today, and despite the fact that there have been women here for nearly 50 years, there is only one woman's picture on the walls of this hall, and she founded the place. I did lobby the master about this last time I was here, and I'm delighted to hear on the grapevine master that things might be about to change. <laughs> I do like to think 
I would highly urge and that respect, because iconography really matters. And of course, we've not had a woman master here yet, but perhaps that will happen in your lifetime, if not in mine. Gender equality was a priority for me here at Clare. It was a priority for me at Christian Aid. And even though I've moved on from Christian Aid, it remains an important aspect of my work. Now I'm the first Church of States Commissioner, a statutory role responsible for oversight of £8 billion pounds worth of investments to help fund the work of the Church of England. On the walls of my office, there are photos of all my predecessors from 1850 onwards. A regular reminder that I am the first woman to have been appointed to the role 167 years after the first First Commissioner took office. The Church Commissioners as active and responsible investors are currently taking companies we invest in to task over gender inequality on their boards. And given that more diverse boards are associated with greater profitability, it seems like the smart thing and not just the right thing to do. We'll be pressing the case hard as we're pressing on other critical issues like the need for decarbonisation in the face of climate change. Our investments produce financial returns for the church, but they also give us a great opportunity to pursue the common good. As Christians, we believe that's our duty and our joy. And on a personal level, it helps me make sense of 20 years in the city, my faith, and a burning desire to see things change for the better. You are halfway through your degree, and for me at 56, I think it's fair to assume that I'm past the halfway mark on my whole life's journey. If there are any lessons to be learned from my experience, perhaps I could suggest three. The first is that some of the most painful and difficult moments in your life can turn out to be the most fruitful. The second is that each day is a new opportunity to choose the path that's right for you. If you feel you haven't made the most of your time so far, or if you've made some choices you don't feel happy with, just choose again. And thirdly, you are unique in your gifts, your possibilities, and yes, your limitations. But you don't have to let your limitations overwhelm you. As Edward Everett Hale put it, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And I will not let what I cannot do interfere with what I can do. The poet Mary Oliver asked this question. What is, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Whatever is your answer, or whatever is your answer for the moment, I wish you all the very, very best. Thank you again for the great honour of this award and for the chance to share this evening with you. And thank you for listening. <laughs>